The dim lights of the restaurant really set the mood. Romantic, tranquil, and serene. I stared into Greg's amazing blue eyes. They were electric and lively. He had a big, goofy smile as he stared back at me while taking a sip of his wine. I poked around my plates, not wanting to eat too fast or take too big a bite and pointlessly embarrass myself. It was our third date, and every time I saw him I felt my troubles go away, like I could lose myself in that moment. I wasn't ready to declare him as the one, but I had strong feelings for Greg. I sipped the final bit of wine left in my glass, hoping that Greg felt the same way about me. Would you like another glass of wine? Greg asked. I nodded and Greg flagged down one of the waitstaff who approached with a bottle of wine. This man, unlike the rest of the waitstaff, appeared a bit unkempt. His uniform was ill-fitting, like it was too baggy for his skinny frame. The man had days worth of stubble and black circles under his eyes. I knew I will sound a bit pretentious, but at a restaurant that upscale, you expect people who are clean-shaven and professional-looking. This man appeared as if he had rolled out of bed and slapped on his crumpled uniform before rushing to work. The man picked up my glass and began to pour, but as he did, I couldn't help but notice that he trained his uncomfortable gaze upon me. To be blunt, I was wearing a rather revealing dress. I wanted to look good for Greg, but it seemed this creep was now oogling me. I averted my eyes, trying not to meet the man's gaze. I was on a date. How could he leer at me like that? I could feel him staring at me, though, as the wine poured. I looked over at Greg, whose eyes looked at me. Then he was looking at the man with a hint of anger. You mind not staring at my girlfriend so much? Greg asked in a firm tone. Despite the weird man standing beside me, I felt my heart thump as he mentioned the word girlfriend. It was quite bold of him to assume that, but it made me happy. The man finished pouring and placed the wine glass back on the table. He gave me a weird half-smile, not even responding to Greg in the slightest, and then walked off. What a creep, I whispered to Greg. Yeah, really. I'm going to talk to a manager about that. That guy was incredibly rude. Let me use the bathroom first, and then I'll track down someone to talk to. Greg got out of his seat, and I watched him as he headed towards the bathroom. I grabbed a glass of wine from the table. It was extremely cold, like the wine was chilled. But it wasn't just the wine. The glass itself was nearly freezing cold. I wondered to myself how the glass could possibly get that cold, but pushing it aside and slugging down two big gulps of wine. Time went by. First five minutes, then ten, then fifteen... I pulled out my phone and saw a text from Rebecca. Hey, how's it going with that Greg guy? You need me to call and bail you out? The text said. I closed the text and finished my glass of wine with one final gulp. I felt a pang of anxiety flare up as I scanned the room looking for Greg. I didn't see him anywhere. My mind raced to the worst possible scenario. That Greg had ditched me. That he wasn't as into me as I was into him. I felt the tears well up in my eyes for a moment, but I held them back as I looked to my left and saw that unkempt waiter approaching my table again. I brought my hand to my face, almost using it as a shield from the guy who approached regardless. More wine? The man questioned. I could feel his eyes on me again, scanning my body. I felt cornered and wanted to leave, to get away from this creep. I wanted to yell and scream to get him away from me, but instead I passively responded with a yes, and the man picked up my glass and began to pour. To my dismay, the man didn't just pour silently. Perhaps emboldened by the fact that Greg was not around, he began to speak to me. His tone was rather nasty, and I felt myself getting scared. What's that guy got that I don't? The man asked me. I felt a lump in my throat as he finished asking the question. I couldn't formulate a response. Tell me, he demanded. Again, I said nothing. I couldn't find the words. I felt on the verge of screaming. Tell me, Laura, 
What has he got that I don't? I felt horrified, but my horror gave way to anger. How the fuck did this man know my name? I grit my teeth, feeling anger well up in me. Get the fuck away from me, or I will scream, I said in a quiet but demanding tone. The man placed the glass down on the table and walked away swiftly. I picked up the glass and wondered if I should even bother to drink it. But I gulped it down anyway, feeling disturbed both by the man and by the fact that Greg has still not returned to the table. I sent Greg a series of increasingly angry texts, but after five more minutes, I gave up on that. I began to quietly cry, trying not to draw any attention to myself. I pulled out my phone and texted Rebecca back, begging her to come pick me up. But what I thought was the worst case scenario of Greg ditching me at the restaurant ended up not being even close to the worst case. The worst case scenario happened a few minutes later as I waited for my ride. A man came out of the bathroom area, panicked, his face red and breathing heavy. He stuttered out the words loudly so that most of the restaurant could hear. Th there's a guy dead in the bathroom. Someone call the police. The man shouted out. The restaurant staff were quick to pull the man to the side. One of the employees rushed to the bathroom to confirm. I felt a sinking feeling as I prayed it was not Greg, but I had to see what was going on. My resolve grew and I got out of my seat and started towards the bathroom. I stormed down the hallway, pushing open the men's bathroom door. Hey lady, you can't come in here! An employee shouted at me, but I ignored him. There it was, the real worst case scenario. Greg laying on the floor, his skin in icy blue his eyes frosted over, lifeless and frozen. His left arm was tossed across the room, his two legs lay severed beside him, both practically shattered. There was a notable lack of blood in the room. Greg was frozen so badly that even his blood had turned solid. I ran from the bathroom, screaming and crying hysterically. Rebecca soon showed up and at first was angry. She leapt from the car, yelling. I knew that guy was an asshole. What a total fucking douche. Don't worry, Laura, we're going to- She stopped when she saw the tears rolling down my face. Or maybe it was the way my face was contorted into a mix of fear and anguish. She gave me a hug and asked me what happened, and I did my best to fill her in between heavy sobs and tears, and soon the police had arrived. They questioned everyone at the restaurant and would not let anybody leave until they gave the okay. They questioned me the longest since I was Greg's date. They asked me if I knew if Greg had enemies, if I knew who might be capable of murdering Greg, but how could someone murder a man like that? Freezing him? It wasn't humanly possible. I asked them how he could have frozen like that, but the detective told me sternly that he asked the questions. The only person I could think of to mention was that weird guy who had somehow known my name. That strange guy seemed angry that I was with Greg. When I mentioned he was part of the wait staff, the detective pointed in the direction of the staff who had all congregated in the parking lot. Can you point out the guy? The detective asked. I scanned the face of all the wait staff, but I couldn't find the guy. I did it again and again, but I didn't see him anywhere. I don't see him. Could he have slipped out? I asked. The detective told me to stay there, and went and got a man from the restaurant staff group. The man was evidently the owner of the restaurant, and he came over to me. The man appeared kind, eyeing me sympathetically. I guess he heard I was the date, and he could tell by my now smeared makeup and puffy red eyes that I was crushed. This woman mentioned one of your staff made some comments that could potentially make him a suspect. Are all of your staff accounted for over there? The detective asked. Yes, I checked twice. Everyone on schedule for the shift is accounted for. No one has left. The detective then told the man that he would need all the surveillance tapes that the restaurant had. The detective gave me his card and told me that I could go home, but if I thought of anything I should give him a call. I went home and slowly tried to recover from the incident, but 
it was not at all easy. I would wake in the middle of the night, screaming, imagining the cold, lifeless body of Greg again. I started going to therapy where I was diagnosed with PTSD and given anti-anxiety medication, as well as some pills to help me sleep at night. It took about three months before I felt better, but the person who murdered Greg had still not been caught. I spent most of my time staying at home now in my room. I lived with Rebecca, and she had been extremely supportive, but she started pushing me to go out and socialize more, to really live again. It was hard, but I finally agreed to go out to a bar with her and a couple of other girls one night. The bar was a bit more relaxed, not as rowdy as some other bars. We got ourselves a table and ordered a few drinks. It wasn't long before the girls started scanning the room for interesting looking guys, and the guys were doing the same. A few started approaching us, singling us out and trying to start conversations, offering to buy drinks. One by one, the girls began to disappear from the table, until I was left sitting with Rebecca. Lighten up, Laura. I know things have not been easy for you, but there's a whole world out there. You can't hide forever. You need to try and enjoy life, and Rebecca's little inspirational speech faded into noise as I looked across the room. I felt my blood go cold as I saw the man. That same creepy man from the restaurant a few months ago. He was trying to be inconspicuous, hanging back against the wall with a beer in his hand. I could see the dark circles under his eyes as he looked at me. He gave me a sly little smile and sipped his beer. I grabbed Rebecca's arm and pulled her hard, interrupting whatever she was saying. Hey, wait, what are you doing? Rebecca said. We need to leave, I shouted at her and pulled her outside as fast as I could. I got in the car and furiously began digging through my purse, looking for the detective's card. Once I found it, I called and the phone rang, and then rang again as I cursed. The phone went to voicemail and I frantically left a message saying that the guy was at this bar and he was looking at me before hanging up. I realized afterwards that I never even said who I was. I had a feeling the detective would have no idea what I was talking about, but... The detective called back no later than 15 minutes, and I quickly explained what was going on, a little less frantically than before. Rebecca drove me home after that, unsure of what to do to help me with the situation. I retreated to my room, crying. I felt an intense pressure pushing down on me, like I was suffocating. I fell to the floor, panicked, barely able to breathe, feeling like I was going to die. It was the first time I ever had a panic attack. I was back to being a near total wreck. The detective called me the next morning and gave me the bad news that the guy had slipped out before they arrived, but that they had gotten more footage of him that might help them identify who he was. The detective said it was obvious from the surveillance footage that the man had followed me into the bar, though they didn't see him get out of any car. He also assigned a policeman to sit outside my house 24-7. He also advised I carry pepper spray wherever I go and remain vigilant, with his last piece of advice being again to call him if I saw anything. It was clear now that I had a stalker, and I was horrified. I had never dealt with anything like this. The stress was almost too much. The police officer sitting outside made me feel a lot safer, but, but it was only a few weeks later that a large bouquet of flowers showed up at my door. A thick envelope came along with it, the front of it reading simply, Laura. At first I didn't think too much about the flowers. It was close to my birthday, so I thought one of my friends may have sent them as a gift. But as I tore open the envelope, I saw a folded up note. As I opened it, a strange feeling came over me, like a cold wave of anxiety. I looked down at the note. I saw an extremely shaky handwriting that filled me with dread. Laura, you melt my icy heart. I have been watching you for some time, safeguarding you from these vile men you used to have relations with. Every time I see you, I am struck by your immense beauty. If only you could accept me, Laura. 
I am the one for you, and I hope you will soon realize that. I look forward to the moment you fall into my arms and we can be happy together. I have included some photos, a symbol of my devotion to you. My hands started to shake. I wanted to tear the note to pieces and never look at it again, but my rational side told me I needed to give it to the police. But then I looked at the photographs. They were a series of pictures of me. The room spun and I felt nauseous. Dozens of photographs of me going out and doing daily things. At the grocery store, the pharmacy, going to work. One was from long before I even met Greg. About a year ago, as I was out at the beach with my friends. Another showed Greg and I eating dinner, the day he had died. Greg's face was scribbled over to the black sharpie. The final photo was the most chilling. It showed my ex-boyfriend, Craig. Body blue and lifeless. His eyes were poked out in the picture. I dropped the pictures on the floor, incredulous and terrified, and began to cry. I felt wholly unnerved. My whole life had been turned upside down by this creep and now he had seemingly killed another person. I called the detective frantically again, telling him about these photos and the letter. He came around the house and gathered the photos and the note as evidence. I asked him rather rudely what the hell they were doing, and why was it so hard to catch this guy. He assured me they were doing all they can, and confirmed that the man appeared to have targeted other guys that I had previously been in a relationship with though he could still not explain how these men were frozen to death. He assured me that I was safe with the officer outside, and I tried to refrain from going out too much. That night I could barely get to sleep, too disturbed from the photos. This psycho was now targeting my exes as well. I tossed, a tur I tossed and turned until I finally managed to doze off, but my sleep did not last long. A ruckus outside woke me up. Hands in the air, I heard a man shout. I scurried to my window and looked out. A hooded man stood about ten feet from the police officer, who had his gun leveled at the man. I said hands in the air, the officer yelled again. The hooded man began to raise his hands into the air, very slowly. But then I saw his hands beginning to glow in icy blue. It was completely unnatural, and I stood in stark terror as they grew ever brighter. From his hands spewed a torrent of ice and cold that projected itself at the officer. The ice hit the officer's shoulder, and I heard him groan in pain, his shoulder icing over. He fired two shots that seemed to strike the hooded man as he recoiled backwards in pain. The hooded man raised his hands again, and they began to glow before unleashing another torrent of cold. It struck the officer's face, and I could hear a final muffled scream as his skin rapidly froze over in the span of seconds. The officer fell over unconscious, and the hooded man moved forward, clutching at his side. The officer had hit him, and I could tell he was bleeding. I screamed as the hooded man loomed over the downed officer before lifting his foot and bringing it down on the officer's face. His head shattered into pieces that spread out all across the street. The hooded man looked up at me, and our eyes met once again. I ducked down from the window, pulling my hand over my mouth. I could hear him as he began making his way towards the door. I grabbed my cell phone and frantically dialed 911. Rebecca was awake now asking me what was going on. I told her to get into bed and lock the door, and that the psycho was outside. She ran to her room and came back, pulling a large knife from a sheath. Fuck that guy. I've had enough of this shit. The man was kicking the front door, trying to knock it down so he could gain access. Rebecca sat ready with her knife. She was brave, but I begged her to not try to fight. He had killed the officer, I knew she was no match. I yelled into my phone to send help now to the operator on the other end who kept asking me to remain calm. The door began to frost over as the man kicked at it, 
and soon the lock gave way with a snapping sound and the door slowly swung open. The man hobbled in, still clutching at his side, blood dripping behind him. Rebecca ran at him with a knife in her hand, but the man held his hands out and the familiar blue glow started again. The cold wave hit Rebecca's feet, and as she continued to try to run, I watched as her body continued forward, but her feet remained frozen to the ground. I heard the tear of flesh as her feet ripped away from the rest of her body. She fell to the ground, blood spurting from her legs, and a look of absolute shock crossed her face, her eyes wide with shock. The man walked forward and kicked the knife from her hand. Rebecca winced in pain, but her face went from shock to anger. Ever defiant, Rebecca spoke again. You fucker. You are gonna pay for this. The man pulled down his hood, and I could clearly see his face. There was that same guy, the one who had been at the restaurant, at the bar. I could only continue to scream as I scrambled up the stairs. Rebecca kept cursing at the man until there was silence and then a shattering noise. I ran into my room and closed the door, locking it and pushing myself into the corner, bringing my legs up to my chest and hugging them. I heard the man come upstairs and then wait outside the door. Laura, my love, it's time for you to accept me, to love me as I have loved you, he shouted through the door. I could never love you. You're a psycho, I yelled back. No, no, you love me. You just don't know me well enough yet. I know you can love me, Laura. We are meant to be. Open the door, Laura. I'm the lover of your life. You just need to give me a chance. Those other guys were no good for you. The man sounded absolutely hysterical at this point, and I remained silent. I could hear the sirens of police cars drawing closer and closer. Oh, I'm bleeding, Laura. That crazy bastard shot me. They don't understand true love like I do. They stand in the way of our love. Open the door, Laura. Let me see your beautiful face. The police cars were outside now, and I could already hear officers pouring into the building. In a matter of seconds, they were up the steps, and my ears began to ring as gunshots rang through the building. For a moment, all was quiet. Then I heard the blip of a radio and heavy footsteps. Suspect is down. Wait a second, he's still moving, an officer said. But a moment later, there was a sickening sound, like an explosion. Cold overtook the house. Items in my room frosted over, before deadly shards of ice radiated out in every direction, piercing through walls and ripping holes in the floor and ceiling. I heard the cries of several officers as the shards pierced their bodies. A single shard pierced my shoulder, sending sharp waves of pain through my body. After all that, it was finally quiet. I clutched at my bleeding shoulder, feeling woozy, and then blacked out. I awoke in the hospital. They told me I had a nasty wound, but that I would be okay. My shoulder still stung. I laid in bed feeling in pain, both mentally and physically, and unsure of what really happened. Was it really all over? And no sooner had I thought that did the detective walk into the room. He pulled up a chair and sat beside me. His face was grim. I'm sorry this all happened to you, he said. Rebecca, did Rebecca make it? The detective looked down. I'm afraid not. We lost six officers as well. I'm sorry. I began to tear up. She had tried to defend me. The officers too who lost their lives. Greg and my ex. So much death in such a little span of time. I pulled up my hair, feeling frustrated and powerless. The man, though, he's dead. You got him? He's dead. This whole thing is over. 
I'm sorry I can't be as comforting as I should. I lost friends too and all this. I'm going to leave for a few weeks. I just wanted to let you know that the man is gone. You don't need to worry about him anymore. If you need anything, then give me a call, the detective said. I thanked him profusely, and as he left the room, I cried and cried. The whole ordeal had taken a huge mental toll on me, and for the next few years I was filled with grief. It took a long time to come to grips with everything that happened, but eventually, I moved on with my life. I found a nice man and got married, had two children. I finally put everything to rest and began to forget about those horrible incidents. It was a cold winter day, and I had just taken my kids to the bus stop to see them off. I returned to my house and sat down in my chair to have a cup of tea. My husband made real good money, so he allowed me to stay home and take care of the kids, the pets, and the house. I looked out the window. It was cold and gray. I felt a chill as a sudden burst of cold air permeated the room. I kept staring out the window, and to my absolute horror, it began to frost over slowly, but only in certain areas. It began to spell out something as I felt dread rise in my chest. Laura, I love you.